open to questions to the Minister for Culture, Arts and Leisure. And I call Mr Peter Weir. Mr Weir. Question number one. Thank the member for his question. The Musical Instruments for Band Scheme, which is administrated by the Arts Council, was put on hold in 2015-16 as a direct consequence of my department's capital budget position. I freely recognise the value of this scheme and remain committed to supporting it going forward, and I will continue to work to ensure that adequate resources are available for this sector. Subject to those resources being made available, I would expect the scheme to be reinstated in the incoming financial years of 2016-17. I want the scheme to be more inclusive and to provide capacity building across the marching band and other musical sectors. This will be subject, obviously, to availability of funding. Call Mr. Weir for supplement. I thank the minister for her answer. Uh, in terms of the priority that's been given to this, um, can I ask the the Minister uh, what bids she put in for funding for 2015-16 in terms of the monitoring rounds on this? Well, certainly I, I did uh, request support uh, in relation to this, but I wasn't successful. I have spoken to colleagues uh, in DFP about a new scheme. Um, I have spoken to my officials in conjunction with the Arts Council. They have spoken to the, the representatives in the Arts Council not just about uh, a continuation of this scheme in the next financial year, but a revision to it, to include other uh, musical sectors. Um, I'll do all I can to have this reinstated, because I believe that it's very important. But it isn't, and it won't be, just for the marching bands. It will include primarily marching bands, but others from different parts <coughs> of uh, the community who are involved in traditional Irish music, who are involved in jazz and blues, pop music, and, and other genres. For Mr Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the latter comments from the Minister. I've always felt that uh, music and early access to it is a hallmark of a, a civilised society. Indeed, if you think about it, just think what early access to music and instruments did for David Bowie and his millions of fans. And in that context, can the Minister outline if there's any other alternative funds available, for example, through the Arts Council, uh, to ensure that uh, younger people have access uh, to music and musical instruments? Well, certainly this is the only scheme that there would have been access to certain musical instruments, although I know even just in terms of marching bands, they have accessed uh, through the Ulster Scots Agency tuition, dance and music tuition, and certainly the Arts Council, even through different schemes, uh, young children are involved in performing arts. They're also involved in Cinemagic, as an example, and they've been involved in community festivals where they're not just involved in certainly the development of music, but also front and back house uh, development and training, you know, even in concerts and festivals, which uh, in itself has proven to lead on to them taking up the uh, musical instrument or being involved in choirs and, and, and the like. And it is important that we do look at this scheme as it was, try and get it reinstated, but certainly amended, to try and be a bit more inclusive than what it currently or what it previously was. Well, Mr Oliver Mike Mullen. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her answer so far? If the Musical Instruments for Bands scheme is reinstated, can the Minister provide assurance that funding will be distributed equally across all musical forms? Well, certainly, I'm sure I know the member will have heard the primary answer I gave to Mr Peter Weir and then subsequent to Mr Fergal McKinney. It is important that this scheme is open and that people, it isn't just for marching bands, that people from other music genres and other sectors can apply for this funding. I have listened to many people from across the community in the past who felt that they would have liked to have applied for the funding, who could tremendously benefit from the funding, but because they weren't constituted as a marching band, were actually prevented from doing so and had great difficulty in getting the development of music, particularly for children and young people, uh, supported. So certainly, if we can get the money reinstated, we'll certainly be looking at revisions to this scheme. Well, Mr. Kieran McCarthy for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, question two to the Minister. Thank the member for his question. Our local art and culture is already internationally renowned. I'm sure the member will agree with me on that. And the impact that the arts and artists from here have made on the world stage far exceeds what, what might be expected from a relatively small population. Artists, as we all know, such as Seamus Heaney, Sinead Morrissey, C.S. Lewis, Van Morrison, Rita Duffy, just to mention a few, 
have already provided a platform to promote the North on an international stage and help to draw the attention of the, of, of the world to our talented and creative uh, people. In support of this, the Arts Council runs a number of schemes to facilitate international arts activity, which enable artists and organisations from around the world to work together to develop collaborative projects. Supplementary question, please. I'm grateful to the, min the Minister for her response. Um, given that the, uh, the regions like Scotland and indeed our neighbours uh, across the border have successfully used increased global visibility for their arts and cultural sector, uh, thereby raising their international profile. Will you, as Minister, uh, and this Assembly commit uh, to making such a policy uh, for us here in Northern Ireland as uh, we move to the end of this Assembly term? The answer is yes, and I would argue that the Arts Council and ourselves are already doing that, not to give it the service to the arts and the artists who are already currently doing that right across the world. I mean, for a place this small, and even an island this small, we have uh, internationally recognised arts and artists, and I think that's something we all can be equally proud of. And just given the se sentiments that the <coughs> member asked in his question, will that be continued? Absolutely. Will we try and build upon it? We absolutely will. Sorry, before calling Mr Dunn, can I ask members please uh, to discontinue speaking while the Minister is speaking? showing discourtesy in bad manners, and that shouldn't happen. I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an assurance in relation to such funding for the promotion of local art and culture that, that it is done on an equitable basis? Because your record to date in relation to unionist culture has been at least very poor. Well, first of all, I don't agree with what the member has to say, but at least I'm fairly consistent, and so is the member. He constantly says things that, quite frankly, are rubbish. Um, that unionist culture and nationalist culture are the culture of others and the culture of us all are so intertwined in this community that unless the member is clearly specific about what he feels that I'm either misrepresenting or not giving due regard to or not giving support for, I quite frankly don't know what he's talking about. And I'm sure anyone who's watching or listening to this will be scratching their heads as well. But at least you're fairly consistent in that. Perhaps the member missed the point. I ask people not to shout or speak from a senatorial position, and I intend seeing that that does not happen. I call Mr. Ian Mill. Can I ask the minister what type of funding is available to support artists uh, internationally? Thank the member for his supplementary question. Certainly, there. There is support for the individual artist travel awards, and these enable individual artists and established music groups, indeed up to four members, to travel from the north right across. There's also professional arts abroad awards, which are made available to arts organizations which have experience or indeed proven potential uh, for exhibitions and performances and other artistic profiling on an international arena uh, to present their work abroad. And then there's also the Artists International Development Fund, for organisations and individuals, uh, and money is made available with uh, support from the British Irish Council in conjunction with the Arts Council. And this programme is used to enhance the North International and artistic development uh, and reputation. And I certainly know that all three uh, have made it easier for people who wish to use their talent and their skills to promote what's best about here and the best about this end abroad. Call Mrs. Karen McKevitt. So, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for her answers? Uh, very often, Minister, we see uh, ideas coming across uh, joint uh, departments, uh, the like of the, like of the Shamrock, the way it uh, involved tourism globally and it, it related to Irishness, whether it was north or south. Um, uh, the like, sorry, um, uh, as symbols. Um, the Irish Milwaukee Festival, um, at which I attended a number of years ago, uh, sold and gave local artists here, small artists, an opportunity to be able to sell their brands. Um, has the Minister any joint approaches with the like of Dale with, uh, to involve uh, schools to come in to sell local art uh, or to support the local artist uh, to help promote and support uh, globally, internationally? Well, I thank the member for a question, and certainly um, I didn't. Uh, 
and haven't met with Dale in relation to going to Milwaukee or about promotion, particularly for children at school. Um, the Milwaukee Festival is, is internationally renowned now and quite rightly points out that many people from across this island and across these islands actually attend that festival, not only to come together, uh, certainly in terms of performances, there have been joint performances, and even there's been joint exhibitions on this island at the Milwaukee Festival. I certainly know that Tourism Ireland um, have actually helped to facilitate that, and I usually would be the company minister for the deputy minister at the NSMC meetings, and that has been raised. Uh, but certainly I know even through the, the City of Culture legacy, particularly in the run-up to the Turner Prize in Lumiere, a lot of the local groups, a lot of groups across the island were using that as a linchpin to try and get some support from America back into the north. And it has a lot of advantages, and any opportunity we get to promote that, I'd certainly be keen to hear what those opportunities are. Call Mr. Gordon Lyons for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number three. I thank the member for his question. The cost of the consultation was £14,300. This was a very successful consultation, which attracted almost 13,000 responses. 95% of those expressed their support for an Irish Language Act. The report of the consultation, which was published on the 18th of December, is available on the departmental website. Mr Lyons for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister not see that um, this consultation was a poor use of resources? Because when you consider the political reality, it is that such a bill would require cross-community support. And my party has made it very clear that we will not be supporting any act like this because not only of how divisive it will be, but because of the cost of um, implementing the use of Irish in courts, of the use of Irish in the Assembly, the Irish language uh, commissioner. Could the member Surely, come to um, a question, please? Up to political reality? Well, the political reality is that um, when it comes to equality, the member and his party have a very, very poor record, a very poor record in implementing <clears throat> what, what were lodged, cited, reported, repeated in internationally uh, bound agreements. The Irish Language Act was in the Good Friday Agreement, and it's in St Andrews, and it's, it's in subsequent after that. Um, I know the member is intelligent, and I can't understand how he fails to, to see the 13,000 responses, 95% of which are supportive. I would suggest that the community out there, and those responses came from right across the community, again, are way ahead of where you and some of your party are at. Other members of the unionist community who responded to this consultation in a very positive way have nothing to fear from an Irish language act, have absolutely nothing to fear from the Irish language. And I would suggest, if you're up for it, talking to some of those people who can maybe allay some of the fears that you may have, but I suspect this is something more fundamental, that you're just anti-Irish language. And I have to say, that is nothing short of pathetic. Could I perhaps ask the, the Minister and the members to address their remarks through the Chair? I call Mrs Rosie McCorley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. August and Jeglo Mira and Ara, in ye and a fragra, all war, a um, fubble, a giri, rakdiakt, a Don Gillica, um, and Jigle he curses the Anu or Nabontashi Don Fubble, and ye at Nagilka Torches Jack. Uh, can I ask the Minister, given the huge uh, public response uh, for legislation on the Irish language, can she um, outline the benefits to the community of an Irish language act being introduced? Gormaugat. Well, Ardous, um, to Brown Oram, uh, last count, Kolya, uh, first of all, apologies to the the Deputy Speaker, because I am not going to homeland for in Fraga. Yes, I absolutely do, or in cash, I absolutely do agree with the member that, given the overwhelming response in relation to the consultation on Achnagilga, the Irish Language Act, there are many benefits that can be accrued from this. First of all, it would be in complete opposition to the previous uh, member's assertions. It would give expression, first of all, that this is an outstanding equality issue that people have absolutely nothing to fear from the Irish language. It doesn't belong to me, it doesn't belong to the Deputy Speaker, it belongs to us all. 
and that is a fundamental misunderstanding for some people. Secondly, for many children and families who Irish is their first language, it would give recognition to them. It would actually end the insults, it would end the, the offence and end some of the nonsense that people continue to peddle. And I think it's regrettable because it gives those unionists who are quite comfortable and happy, and indeed all people who are quite comfortable and happy, who learn the Irish language recognition of their endeavours. But more importantly, more importantly, given the latest census and going back to even previous census, there is documented evidence that there are more people who have Irish as a first language, there are more people who are learning langui the language and have a working knowledge of the language, and indeed have an entitlement to goods and services through the medium of Irish. After all, Irish language users are ratepayers and taxpayers as well, and they too have rights. And I will do everything in my power to ensure that those rights are protected, but above all else, respected. Call Mr. Patsy McGlue. Egerin Sugarsa, Edive Kurhan Kin, uh, Achna Giliga. I'd like to thank the Minister for her answer there, albeit maybe a bit more detail would be required, but I would like to ask her how much money she has put aside within her department specifically for the promotion of Achna Giliga. Well, the member will be aware that um, certainly until I get the responses back, which are actually due back from all the other departments within this week and the next week. Um, the, the eventual and the, the, the final cost of implementing an Ochtna Gilga is unknown. However, I have made it clear, very, very clear, very clear consistently from coming into my department in May 2012, like any other equality implication and obligation, money will be found in the department. I am completely committed to that. Um, but certainly, I know that given the responses that I have received thus far and hopeful of the responses yet to come, that this myth that the Irish language is going to cost hundreds of millions of pounds is completely wrong. Mr Declan McAleer for a question. Uh, Kester, I have a question for the whole. I thank the member for his question. Gail Fubble Cantor, Sistroth Ban, uh, based in West Tyrone, has been allocated £307,100 under Forest and Gilga scheme for Bill Gilga for the period of January 2011 to June 2016. Certainly as follows, uh, in 11, the years 11, 13, uh, 100 and, over £170 for £14, £58,000 for £15, £38,000 for £15, £19,000 and they have been offered 20, over £20,000. Uh, for the periods of 16. Forsna Gilga received uh, 29 applications for Scam Pubble Gilga for 2016 to 2020, which included two applications from West Tyrone. Each application is currently being registered and sifted to ensure that the required material is enclosed with each application, and after that, an assessment process will take place and successful groups notified before the end of June. I can hear for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the uh, Minister for her answer. Can the Minister give an update on the Scheme Pubble Gaelic funding for all Irish uh, language groups? Well, certainly, there are, I mean, there are many. There are, certainly, there are well over 20 odd applications, if not more, but I will provide those details when the application process and that's been completed. But at the North South Ministerial Council in November past, we agreed to implement the Refise Scheme. And indeed, there have been certainly implementations or revisions on that uh, since then. The scheme, uh, Pubble Officer, will have a new focus aimed at encouraging small groups and certainly language groups from across the network to look at applications. Um, and indeed, how do we actually support the underinvestment uh, in these areas for a period of years? And these proposed changes are aimed at ensuring the significant investment of the, six, the 19 communities on this scheme is not lost. At the same time, enabling groups and communities who are not currently benefiting from the scheme to re receive funding and indeed support. Mr. Thomas Buchanan, for supplementary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, is this funding only available for a specific type of group, or is it uh, open for uh, groups of all cultures or cross community or whatever, and how does a group make an application for it? Well, I am actually encouraged that the members asked this question. 
It's primarily for the development of Irish language. So if any group in your constituency in West Tyrone wants any information regarding this, I'd be happy to furnish them with that. But the details were in the local press. We were given to groups who received funding. They were widely advertised within the Irish uh, language sectors and networks. But if he's any particular interest for a group that he wants me to try and give support to, I'm happy to have that presentation. Mr. Martin O'Mullier. Um, I want to ask the Minister, and it's, and it's heartening to hear of uh, so many positive uh, community and Irish language activities right across the north, but really I suppose what the Minister is doing is uh, providing funding to the real society out there. She's reflecting uh, the bilingual nature of our society, and sometimes you don't see that, Mr Deputy Speaker, but I want to ask her, would you continue not only to change society, but to reflect the fact that there's a vibrant Irish language community out there which needs funding for their many activities. Thank you. Um, I absolutely will. And as I said to our colleague, Declan McAleer, uh, originally it went to 19 groups under this scheme. It's now been extended to support 26. And indeed, I would anticipate in the years after that, that demand will grow and that should be reflected in any future funding schemes. Irish language community is a very vibrant community. It's now becoming a lot cross community, including those who have made these shores their home, who want to learn the Irish language. And I think, to be quite honest with you, a lot from this chamber could certainly learn a lot from people who are involved in the development of the Irish language when they're looking at respectfulness, inclusivity, and genuinely, genuinely trying to learn a language that they feel will enhance them but certainly enhance their families and their children. Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I, I recognise what the Minister said about the development of the Irish language, but can, can I ask her, please, if she would give us an update on why, in fact, there hasn't been a similar project for Ulster Scots to that of the Leofa scheme, which has been so successful? Well, certainly, um, the LIFA is around language acquisition and language development, and the member will be well aware that there have been ongoing difficulties certainly in relation to the language acquisition and language development in Ulster Scots. So given that situation, I didn't make it difficult for people from the Ulster Scots community to come forward for a similar LIFA type initiative. In fact, I asked them to base it on culture and heritage, given the sensitivities, but indeed the real challenges around development of the language. I, I'm still open, and I still remain open to having those representations. And if the member has any influence within that community or any ideas about how to bring stuff forward, I'm open to, to hearing those presentations. Well, Mr. Sam Gardner for a question. Mr. Deputy Speaker, question number five. Thank the member for his question. Uh, I took up my position as Minister of this department, as a member will, will know, in May 2011. And every year since then, most other executive colleagues and I have had to face successive cuts to our resource budgets. And the reason for this is that the Tory administration has decided to impose austerity measures on a community that is still emerging from conflict and still weighed down uh, by a lack of investment and indeed underinvestment and underprovision in their public services. So when the member speaks of protection of budgets, certainly I support him in that but also ask them to look at in the face of a continuing austerity measures that are imposed by the Tories, that we are trying to protect those most vulnerable within our department. And I'm certainly looking at around 5.7 reduction, another reduction in my grant available, not only to ALBs, including libraries, but also other ALBs and indeed within my own department. Mr Gardner for some Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, thus far for her reply. But does the Minister agree with me that as the library service is, vital one, is a vital one, it must have a secure base in this time of change in government? Well, the member will be aware that, given all the austerity measures that have been imposed upon us, that I have done my best, my utmost, to protect libraries as much as possible from those cuts. Uh, I can't give those assurances in the future. I absolutely can't. Do I recognise the, the value of libraries and communities? I absolutely do. And particularly in rural communities, once a library and a service goes, it's very difficult to have that service replaced. And I'm very mindful of that. Uh, but certainly, getting into this new budget, which hasn't been finalised yet, and getting into these settlements, uh, what I'd ask the member to do is join with us, and indeed some others who were previously deficit deniers, 
and calling for greater protection of our budgets, if not increasing our budgets, to ensure that our frontline services are protected. Call Mr. Nelson McCausland. Um, one of the, the key elements in uh, tracking people into libraries is the bookstock and ensuring that the bookstock is adequate and up to date. Um, could the minister tell us um, what her target figure is um, in terms of spend on books per person um, in going forward into the negotiations uh, about budget? Um, what would be the target figure? Well, I'm reluctant to give a target figure, and the member will know why. Uh, because. To be honest with you, I'm trying to ensure that as much protection, uh, particularly in relation to libraries, is afforded as possible. So I don't want to give a figure that may be changed, and then the member will use it against me at a future date, just to be frank about it. So let's, let's be honest. Let's start the year and being honest and not being silly. I know, and the member will know, that I have tried to protect libraries in the past, and I will continue to do that. And that includes keeping the, uh, certainly the momentum around the stock for libraries and certainly the staff that provide an excellent service within our libraries to ensure that that stock is not only delivered to the users but also that all the other programs that are delivered in the library in conjunction with the community are also supported and protected. Mr Daniel McCrossan. Uh, Minister, given uh, that libraries are the hub in all of our communities and taking into consideration the vital services and facilities they provide to uh, various communities, even in, in my very rural constituency of West Tyrone, can I ask if the Minister uh, in the new budget will allow for any libraries to uh, uh, open uh, more for, for a strength in opening hours, basically? Well, certainly, um, I welcome the member to the Assembly, take this opportunity to welcome the member, but certainly libraries in West Tyrone. East Tyrone, South Down, Belfast, wherever they are. One of the good things about libraries is that a lot of people now are joining them. They're supporting the libraries, they're supporting their services, and they're all arguing not only for the hours that they have to be maintained, but certainly asking for those libraries to be protected. That's something that I'm very mindful of. I've said it to other members and I'll repeat it again. I have in the past protected libraries against all other ALBs that have received a, a lesser reduction to their budgets as a result of the Tory administration on other, other ALBs. I will try my very best to ensure that that's the case for the future, but I can't stand here and give the member or anybody else guarantees around that. And given the situation we are in our budgets, I would ask a member in his party, along with Samuel Gardner's part, party, to join with the rest of us in ensuring that not only we get more money from our Black Grant, which we're entitled to, but we also need it to ensure that essential services like libraries and others are protected and secure in the future. Mr Danny Kennedy. Yes. The use of the term North of Ireland in the sub-regional programme for soccer consultation does not mean that clubs located in the 26 counties of Ireland will be eligible to apply for funding on this scheme. To be considered for funding, venues must be located in counties Armagh, Antrim, Derry, Down, Fermanagh or Tyrone. Mr Kennedy for supplementary. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I welcome uh, the um, confession from the Minister that uh, it will not mean uh, money is being uh, spent uh, or allocated to clubs outside this jurisdiction. And can I ask the Minister and plead with the Minister uh, to, to uh, stop, to stop uh, refusing to use the term Northern Ireland simply for a political reason and for no good reason at all. You are a minister in the Northern Ireland Executive. You are expected to, be, to, to, to reform on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland. It's time you and your party realise that. Well, first of all, as a former minister, I think that's a fairly poor question. And what's even more disappointing is the subsequent and follow-up question. It actually shows that, first of all, and just to be clear, I have absolutely nothing to confess. I have no problem saying Northern Ireland. It's not, it's not, it's not a term I use. It's absolutely not a term I use. But I actually think the member really asking a question, given his role in the executive and various departments, asking a question like this really shows that it's, really, it's like backroom boy stuff. Seriously, it's really, really sad that someone like you is asking a question like that. William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to join with me 
in congratulating the Northern Ireland national manager, Michael O'Neill, on recently being awarded Coach of the Year at the Sports Personality of the Awards, which were held in Belfast very successfully recently. Can I say that I am pleased to hear what the Minister has said about funding not being given to football grounds outside this jurisdiction, and we will watch that closely. Can I ask the Minister, does she agree with me that if, if that was to happen, that would fly in the face of the, the policy which Sport and I are currently embarked upon of not providing funding for boxing clubs affiliated to Northern Ireland Boxing Association? The member was aware that when the consultation around the sub-regional soccer funds was announced on the 30th of November, that the criteria was laid out was very, very clear. So any hyperbole around clubs uh, in the 26 counties being able to access needs to be nipped in the bud. If people are peddling that, they're doing it for political reasons, and it's silly. I too congratulate Michael O'Neill and indeed the rest of the team. I think he's been an amazing manager. He's an amazing person. I think the team have done very, very well, uh, and I wish him well for the future. Um, in relation to watching closely if any clubs access the money, um, fine, knock yourself out. But the criteria is very, very clear. In relation to boxing, it's the governing body, it's the governing body and the affiliation, and the member will be aware that there's only one way in which clubs can affiliate, and that's through the Irish Amateur Boxing Association. And rather than not give support and put clubs under pressure who want to affiliate and access funds, I would ask a member and other members to give those clubs support in giving them the much-needed funds. Boxing facilities are some of the worst. It's not a good record. And what we should be doing is actually giving clubs a hand up and a hand out, rather than putting their foot down to stop them getting across the door in the first place. It's sad and it's ridiculous. That ends the period for list of questions. And before going on to the topic of questions, could I remind members for the third time that uh, remarks should be made through the chair. There should be no cosy little conversations. And perhaps I could invoke the help of the, the whips in ensuring that the respective members really are model members during this session. I call Mr Gordon Lyons. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. What steps uh, is the Minister's Department taking uh, to ensure that the Battle of the Somme is commemorated this year? Well, certainly my department, along with my colleagues in Daddy, starting off with Minister, who is now the First Minister, Arnold Foster, commenced upon celebrating and commemorating and reflecting upon the decade of centenaries. So I, I have given support to exhibitions, given support to lectures, uh, talks in different libraries and museums and public venues, and I will continue to do that. Mr Lyons for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for uh, her answer? Yesterday, uh, the Deputy First Minister in this place said that it is an important year for unionism with the 100th anniversary of the Battle of the Somme. I think those were remarks that should not have been made because the Battle of the Somme is not just associated with the unionist community or those of a Protestant background, but rather Men, both uh, Roman Catholic and Protestant Unionist and Nationalists, uh, left these shores and went to, to fight uh, in uh, France. Isn't that important that that is remembered uh, during these commemorations, that, that no one community owns um, the Battle of the Somme? Well, yes, I agree with you, and I actually think that you're misrepresenting the sentiments in which Mark McGuinness said. He recognised the importance of the Somme within the Unionist community. He's well, he's well aware. He is well aware of the numbers of people and indeed the background of the people who left these shores to die elsewhere. He's well aware of that. And we have been very generous, we've been very consistent, we've been very open in giving acknowledgement and respect to all the events that will be marked as part of the decade of centenaries. Mark McGuinness has done it, I have done it, other members have done it. I've encouraged the member and members from the opposite branches to do likewise. Well, Mr. Kieran McCarthy for a topical question. Garam Eli, I got last come call you. Uh, could I say to the, or ask the Minister, the recent draft strategy highlighted the benefits uh, of the arts in relation to health and education and tackling poverty. Can the Minister tell how the core funding uh, for the arts will be protected in the new department so that it continues to have those social benefits to all of the people in Northern Ireland or the north of Ireland? I thank the member for his question and indeed his consistency in terms of highlighting and raising the importance of the arts. The culture and arts strategy, the consultation, is very important as a member will know. 
Unlike sport, arts did not have an overarching interdepartmental approach, and I think it's really important and it values and gives recognition to the arts in ensuring that not only does the new Department of Communities have responsibility, but indeed, as a member has mentioned, in terms of health and other departments, that they, we collectively have a responsibility. And when that consultation ends, I would assume that that gives us the evidence to go in and argue for a greater and better budget, and that's something that I will I, I'd be very, very keen to do. Before I leave this department, consultation is finished and the evidence is there. Well, Mr. McCarthy, for supplementary. Thank you. Can I ask her what discussions uh, has the Minister or is she having to ensure that the new department is structured in such a way that the arts remain a central part of the, department's, the new department's work? Well, certainly, the restructuring of departments is well underway and arts is up there in lights. So, just to give the member assurance and reassurance around that. Uh, and not even that, it's not good enough, from my point of view, just to leave the department and close the door behind you. I want to leave this department with a very strong, robust strategy for culture and arts for the next 10 years, and not even that, but leave it with a, a budget. And I certainly I know that there are challenges out there, and the member will be aware of those. But from my point of view, arts is there, arts will be there, and the strategy for culture and arts that will be interdepartmental will actually leave it in a much better position than I found it. Call Mr. Chris Hazard for topical question. Can I ask the Minister to provide an update on the Executive's plans for the decade of centenaries, please, Gormagut? Well, certainly in response to a previous topical question, the Executive uh, agreed to a package uh, and indeed mm. agreed to recognise the decade of centenaries from 2012 onwards. I certainly have been involved in funding some of those. I do think it's something we need to have a look at again in terms of the Executive about getting additional money in because it will help promote tourism. But above all else, I think it will actually foster greater awareness and a better understanding, and that's something I'm committed to doing. Well, Mr. Hazard for a supplement. Good, and I thank the Minister for her answer. I wonder what sort of opportunities exist to explore the sensitivities and I suppose the complexities of some of these events. 2016 alone, we were going to mark the, the huge waste of life at the Battle of the Somme at the behest. Uh, of the old empires, and of course the Easter Rising, of course, which was the catalyst for the spark of many anti-colonial movements that would bring these old empires crashing down some years later. Uh, so, what opportunities exist for discovering some of the complexities and sensitivities involved, Gormagut? Well, certainly, I know with even even within the, and I agree with what the members had to say. Certainly, with, even within DECAL, for example, we've got libraries and we've got museums and you've also got public records. And even at Christmas, we've seen a, a, you know we've seen examples of the, the human impact of young people leaving here and, in many cases, not coming back. But certainly I know, even for children and young people who have a thirst for knowledge and want to have greater understanding, I think we would be really foolish, each and every one of us in this assembly, to miss the opportunities that the decade of centenaries will present to us. Certainly will present challenges for us all, but if, and it is an if, we are mature and open enough to have those discussions, I think that legacy will do more than the actual events. And I do think some people in this House are missing opportunities in their approach to these. Call Mr. Robin Newton for a question. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy, Deputy Speaker. Um, I wonder if I could ask the Minister, would the Minister recognise that uh, there has been much good work done in and around the re-imaging of communities? And would the Minister indicate whether or not she would be either supportive of that work or indeed an extension of that work. Because it is my belief that there is a, a willingness within certainly parts of the community uh, and maybe geographically or geographical parts of the community to actually extend this good work uh, and then carry on the, the, the activities that have meant so much in changing the image of Belfast. Well, I completely agree with the member. Actually, as part of the consultation, I have met quite a lot of groups, including some of the mural artists. I appreciate there are many who have a very specialist um, skill and expertise, and who are not just changing or re-imaging the gable wall or whatever part of the community is. They're actually having children and young people involved in that process, many of which, many of which have maybe been engaged in anti-community activity, who have maybe been engaged in graffiti, who are now involved in re-imaging their communities. And for that reason alone, I'm very supportive of it. But certainly as part of the consultation around the culture and arts strategy, it is a theme that's reoccurring, and I'm actually delighted to see it. 
And just to give the member assurance, that is common from right across the community. And it isn't just replacing old political murals with new messages. It's actually creating murals that haven't even been done before, giving messages which are very, very positive, and I think that's something we need to look at. Call Mr Newton for supplementary. I welcome the activity, I welcome the uh, assurances from the Minister in that respect. I wonder if I could ask the Minister, might she give some examples of how she would take it forward and what sort of budget line she's prepared to add uh, to, to devote to the activity? Well, certainly one of the ways that I'm currently looking at, and I appreciate, I'm sure the member will appreciate, I don't want to come to definitive or conclusions, definitive positions or conclusions and, and before the consultation around this has ended. But already we have enough evidence and already we have enough demand and will to have this scheme reinstated. Now, it, without being definitive, it is something that if it keeps coming up in the consultation and even for the, the, the amount of people who have expressed uh, a position in having that scheme reinstated, if that was seen as part of the new uh, development and certainly as part of the new development of the consultation and indeed the new plan for the new department, then that is something that needs to be funded and costed for. And not just looking at the actual event of, of putting a mural down, which in itself is very important, but what I think has been missing in the narrative around it is a process of getting residents and communities involved getting a discussion and consultation of what, about what's going on in the walls and indeed what inclusion there are citizens and residents around that, not just for the mural but indeed the upkeep of it and how it reflects and symbolises as many people as possible. I think that's something I'd like to see in the finalised uh, strategy going forward. Well, Mr John McAllister for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, does the Minister acknowledge that the ongoing uh, delay and circumstances surrounding Caseman Park creates a, a fairly bad optic and a poor background uh, for those putting together the all-island bid for the Rugby World Cup? Well, certainly I am fully aware, thank the member for his question, uh, by the way, I am fully aware that uh, in relation to the Rugby World Cup 2023 bid, Caseman Park is an integral part of those plans. I have met, and I know the GAA have met, uh, with rugby uh, across the island, Irish rugby and Ulster rugby, but right across the island, to not only give updates in relation to the ongoing situation with Caseman Park, but also to ensure and give people assurance that everything can be done, has been done and will be done. And I do believe that some of the accusations that were made, certainly in committee rooms, but certainly in this chamber, haven't been appreciated by people across this island. And Notwithstanding the fact that there are difficulties, notwithstanding the fact that there are challenges, I think if we continue on a basis of being open-minded about taking a candy attitude towards resolution, then we all collectively need to build and redevelop Caseman Park. Mr McAllister for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for her reply. And it's something that I'm sure we all hope and want desperately to see happen. It just would be a brilliant uh, spectacle for the entire island. Uh, would you acknowledge that when the, the Rugby Football Union look and take into all of the factors, they will look and judge our ability to efficiently and effectively deliver on a major event, and that will be a consideration for them? And they have, and, and certainly I have been part of the uh, chorus of people who have also reminded uh, that we have hosted international events and global events here. We've had Giro, we've had World Peace and Fire Games, we've had the City of Culture, we've had the Turner Prize, we've had Lumiere, we've had one big, one big weekend, and it goes on, it goes on, and that's something that we all collectively can take some civic and community and political pride in. Notwithstanding that, I will continue to do that because it's true. I will also give assurance that everything this executive, which is a programme for government commitment, will do to ensure that Caseman Park is redeveloped. But more importantly, more importantly, that the people in West Belfast who are waiting on the redevelopment of Caseman Park will get Caseman Park. And I know the member would agree with me in ensuring, for all the reasons that he's outlined and for us, all those that I've outlined, it just needs to happen. It is inconceivable that GAA Gilly Games will not have a facility that's fit for purpose in, on my watch and indeed on anybody's watch. I call Mr. Sean Lynch for a topical question. And call you. Given that my own constituency minister has seen some of the worst flooding in decades, can the minister give an update on how uh, 
uh, how Waterways Ireland, DECAL, have worked with other agencies and departments to provide assistance for those most affected? Well, certainly, the, and I know at times present, but certainly a member will be aware. I, he was there when I, at the request of Minister Michelle O'Neill, visited Dennis Gillen and the surrounding areas, particularly in relation to Waterways Ireland headquarters. I'm absolutely uh, convinced that everything that can be done was done, but certainly listen to Mr O'Neill even yesterday at the executive and other ministers. We're now looking at preventative measures, and that's something that the member should take some assurance for. But I have been in regular contact with Waterways Ireland, and I was content that they were doing their utmost in working with other statutory bodies and partners to ensure that the people who were affected the member's consistency, that the worst impacts were brought to minimal as much as possible. Mr Lynch for supplementary. My um, and I want to thank the Minister for coming down prior to Christmas to, to see how the agency were dealing with what was a fairly dramatic incident. Can she ensure that when it's safe to do so, post flooding inspections take place and uh, preventative measures are considered and brought forward to the executive collectively uh, for action in the future? I absolutely will. Uh, I will give the member that assurance, and I also will make a member aware when I'm in his constituency again to look at post flooding and the impact, and indeed the clean up that he can see first hand from himself and hear from those agencies just what has been done and what the intention is to do for the future where possible. Order, time is up. Uh, members will take the ease while we change the top table.